Hello, my name is Daniel Cooper. I'm a seminarian for the Diocese of Knoxville. I'd like to welcome you to another video in our Clergy Conversation series from the Adult Faith Formation Program here at St. Thomas the Apostle Church. Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good and gracious God, you were with the Israelites in the desert, offering your grace and protection. We ask you to send your spirit among us to show us what you would have us experience and understand while providing that same grace and protection. We ask this through Christ your Son, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I'm honored to be presenting to you um, and hope that the information that I'm going to discuss is of some interest. Uh, I know for myself, uh, this is an area that has a lot of really deep meaning for me personally. Um, you'll notice in the prayer just now that I invoked imagery of the Israelites in the desert, and there's a reason for that. Um, it's because there is such a rich connection between the ancient Jewish tradition and our modern day liturgy. And that's kind of what this talk is, is centered around. When I was coming up with the idea of what the title for this topic might be, um, synagogue to seminary, it, it struck me as, as something kind of appropriate to, to discuss. You know, how does one go from being um, born Jewish to entering the seminary and, and what does that mean in terms of our liturgy for our Catholic faith? So a bit of background might help explain why this is such uh, of an interest to myself. Um, I'm, I'm not only a convert to Catholicism, but I'm also a convert to Christianity. I was born a Jew and was a practicing Jew for a number of years as a young child. Um, before becoming Christian, that was my world. That was how I viewed everything through that lens. Having that as a formative period of my life really helped to ex expand what it meant when I finally became Christian, I could finally see that it wasn't two separate religions. Christianity really is the fulfillment of everything that we believe as, as Jews. Having that experience really helped when I had my first visit to a Catholic church and my first attendance at a mass. All the things that were happening during the liturgy really evoked a lot of flashbacks to some of the earliest formative periods of my life. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about those here in just a bit. There's so much that could be said um, for the connections between the liturgical worship of the Jews and the liturgical worship of that of Catholics and the Mass. It would require far more time than we have to cover here, but I hope to focus on two main things, the Jewish Passover and the Jewish hope for new manna in the Messiah. The Catechism of the Catholic Church is very, very clear about the necessity of understanding the Jewish roots of our, of our worship. In paragraph 1096, it even states that a better knowledge of the Jewish people's faith and religious life as professed and lived even now can help our better understanding of certain aspects of Christian life. Furthermore, to understand Christian liturgy, we must first understand Jewish liturgy. Now, we all know the standard story found in Exodus of the first Passover. You know, just a quick recap, you have the Israelites who've been enslaved in the land of Egypt. God sends forth a messenger to deliver them. And all that comes about during that entire play between the Israelites and Moses and Pharaoh really sets up the roots and the beginnings of what Jewish liturgy and Jewish Passover looks like and how that informs our own understanding of the Mass. What exactly is that first Passover? Well, it involved being saved, salvation, essentially, from the hand of Pharaoh, from the hand of sin, as it were. And in Exodus chapter 12, we can kind of see that procedure of what that looked like. So it involved a sacrifice of a one-year-old, unblemished male lamb, having a hyssop branch to paint the doorpost with the blood of that lamb, but most importantly, eating the flesh of that sacrificed lamb. What's probably the most important thing to notice here is that third requirement, eating the flesh of the sacrificed lamb. The sacrifice was not done until that flesh had been consumed. The entire process is similar as we find in the Bread of Life discourse. Christ himself discusses being his, his flesh being that for the life of the world. 
The specifics surrounding the Passover celebration and the prescribed rituals can be found in a bunch of different places, but more specifically in the Mishnah. It's a, it's a large text that has a lot of collection of Jewish rites, Jewish traditions, how things are to be celebrated. The specific touch point between the Passover and the Mass is in the invocations of blessing during the Passover. If you've been to any Catholic Mass anywhere in the world, these prayers would sound familiar. During the Passover ritual, there are two that stand out. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, who brings forth bread from the earth. And blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Sound familiar? It's the very same thing that we hear from the priest during those words of, of institution, just before the words of institution, and prayers over the offering. Seeking another connection that harkens back to the Passover tradition takes us to the Seder meal at Passover in modern, in modern Judaism. During that meal, a child typically will ask, why is this night different from other nights? And the father or the oldest male present will always respond because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. It's a verbal exchange between an elder in the faith and someone who's trying to learn about the faith tradition to understand exactly what's being celebrated. It's a remembrance that God did something specific for a group of people, and it's the same for us every time we celebrate the Mass. It's a remembrance that God did something specific and unique for us individually and collectively. Think about it. At the Mass, what are we doing every time that it's celebrated? The priest is making present again the one sacrifice in a non-bloody manner. In that moment, we're present at Calvary. Through the celebration of the Mass, we're among the saints as they worship in heaven. It's all connected, both present, past, and future, to show that, that long-standing history of salvation. This connection it would have been exceedingly clear to first century Christians who, in fact, were Jews. They would have understood the words of Christ as a remembrance or anamnesis from the Greek. It's not simply, let's get together, let's remember and talk about the good times, but, but let's actually make present again to us what we know from the past. Again, the Catechism has something to say in this regard. In paragraph 1364, it says that when the church celebrates the Eucharist, she commemorates Christ's Passover and it's made present. The sacrifice of Christ offered once for all on the cross remains ever present. In fact, these early Christians would have seen more clearly that connection than we do. It is, after all, both sacrifice and meal. So how far back does that connection really go? Think back to the Israelites roaming the desert after they had left Egypt. It's recounted in chapter 16 of the book of Exodus. They were complaining about not having any food to eat and wondering why Moses had led them out into the desert on the instruction of God just to die when they could have been just as happy in Egypt and at least been fed. So what does God do? Despite their complaining, as a loving father, he provides food for them, meat and bread. Significant portion of this miracle for our purpose to understand is that what's found in the bread or manna the Israelites are provided with bread every morning, and it tastes like honey. It's, it's a foretaste of the land that they've been promised. If you remember, they've been promised from ages past a land that's flowing with milk and honey. Even though their physical needs being met, they realize that the man is not ordinary bread, but instead they label it as bread from heaven. As such, they treat it as something holy something that must be revered and reverently cared for. In fact, they end up placing some of it in a golden urn and keeping it in a tabernacle. That should sound familiar to us. Hopefully, the connection is not lost on us between this bread from heaven of the Israelites and what they experienced and our own experience of the Eucharist. In the sacrifice of the Mass, the bread is changed into the very body of Christ. It becomes that new bread from heaven. Christ himself uses that term to describe himself in John chapter 6, verse 51, 
He says that he is the bread that came down from heaven. In fact, just a few verses prior, in verses 49 to 50, Jesus makes the connection even more unmistakable. He says, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the desert, but they died. This is the bread that come down, comes down from heaven, so that one may eat it and not die. In these short verses, Jesus assures the Jews of his time exactly what that connection will be for them and how to maintain that touch point with their ancestors, now in a more perfect and fulfilled way. That same bread from heaven we receive every time we attend Mass, every time we receive the Eucharist, we receive that same gift, that same connection that the ancient Jews had to their ancestors in the desert, and that same promise that they had of a new bread from heaven coming in the Messiah. Jesus also sets up a reminder for us in the Our Father when he's teaching his disciples how they should pray. The line, give us this day our daily bread, has a really, really clear understanding baked into it. The original text in the Greek, the word that's used for daily, is actually epousios, which roughly translates to a super substantial or supernatural. That meaning would not have been lost on the disciples and those hearing the words of the prayer. They would have understood that by meaning supernatural, Christ himself was referring to that, that bread of the Messiah, that new bread from heaven. And therefore, the early Christians recognized that there was definitely something different about what they were celebrating. And it shouldn't be any surprise to us now as we realize that there's something very different to what we celebrate. Even within the Mass, we find a subtle message pointing to that reality. If you listen closely to the words of the Epiclesis of, of the Eucharistic Prayer 2, you can hear the connection. The priest, as he's extending his hands over the gifts, says these words, Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. That very short phrase, like the dewfall, it's that link made back to the bread given to the Israelites in the desert, that bread from heaven, that manna. Moreover, it's evident in the church that this same sacrifice isn't just a once a week occurrence. The mass is celebrated daily around the world. Just as that manna from heaven was provided to the Israelites in the desert every morning for their benefit, for their food, we are provided with that same opportunity every day in the Mass to receive the very body of Christ, that new bread from heaven. So what does all of that mean for someone who is discerning the priesthood? Like I said, having a, having a Jewish upbringing really made clear upon entering the church that something was different, something was present in the celebration of the Mass that doesn't occur anywhere else on earth. And it's that very thing, that very person, that can make all the difference, not only for somebody who's discerning the, the priesthood, but for the daily life of every single Catholic, every single Christian around the world, when we recognize that Christ comes to us in the Eucharist every day, that new bread from heaven. And if we're willing to accept and receive that gift, we can be empowered to change the world for the better, however we're called, however we choose to respond to that gift of Christ.